Hey guys, it's Mana here, and we're back with more Lucid 9. Uh, when we last left off, Rui, not Rui, um, Misaki took us up on the roof. And I predict trouble coming from that. So yeah, we're just gonna jump back in. Akira is waiting by the front gate, eyes fixed on her shoes. Once again, I'm stricken by how empty the entrance is. Oh, Colonel. Morning. Um, uh, morning. I noticed her unusual reaction, but I decided to let it go. Cafeteria? Yeah. She leads the way to the school dining hall, her footsteps heavy against the brick pathway beneath our feet. The large extravagant room is also remarkably empty. Only a few early stragglers are scattered around the corners, scrolling idly through their phones or bobbing their heads to music. Ekra leads me to a table near the wall, settling in a cushioned chair with her arms resting lightly on her knees. Can I ask you something, Colonel? What? Why did you come? Why did I come? What kind of question is that? You seemed awfully torn up about something. And that's why you came? I guess. But what about Rui? Huh? You're worried about her, right? She is, after all, your one true love. I can only snort. She's my friend, if that's what you mean. And you honestly don't feel anything for her? Not romantically. Aren't we supposed to be talking about her and Rui, not me and Rui? What is it? We fought. The words are so plain and direct that it takes me a moment to process. After the impromptu drama performance, she was really upset. From the performance? That would have been nice, but no. I'd tell you why, Colonel, but then I'd have to kill you. She rapidly switches between saying something deathly serious and saying something flippant. I'm not sure how to react to her words. Uh, right, and? And war was to be had. We turned against one another, brother against brother, and mother against mother. The words were harsh, the strikes were unclean, and neither claimed victory. Her wild imagination seems to be getting the better of her. From what I can tell, she and Rui had a terrible argument. So what happened? Her forces fled and did not return. For five and a half hours, we lay in wait readying our weapons for the moment when they would once again lay siege to our fortress. But that time never came. You waited five and a half hours for her to come back. Poot, you're so unimaginative, Colonel. On the contrary, I'm pretty sure that Acura has a little too much imagination. It borderlines on delusion. I won't judge, though. Not today. If anything, her scenarios seem to be a coping mechanism. Why didn't she tell you she was going home? Was the argument that terrible? It lasted for seven score years and resulted in billions of casualties. So it must have been incredibly intense. Interesting. I'd never witnessed Acura and Rui in a fight. With their similar personalities, I would have thought that they would try to solve things peacefully. Still, you were worried about her. You were a good friend. No, no, I'm a terrible friend. I'm just like a politician. I'm too scared to do anything directly, so I became a, a liar to get what I wanted. The harsh self-criticism is enough to unsettle me. Perhaps it's simply my inner nature to be contradictory and the, a devil's advocate, but I want to counter everything she has to say. An actual terrible, <clears throat> an actual terrible friend would never say that. So you may say. But this isn't anything new, Colonel. I can't seem to help anyone. Not as myself. Not as Shadow Bell. Not as a dragon. My brain suddenly makes a connection, and finally I understand something. Is that why you try so hard to be different? Different people change the world, Colonel. Aren't you just lying to yourself? She smiles sadly, an edge of pain to her lips. If I can help just one person, what does it matter? 
Then again, it looks like I can't even do that. She abruptly stands, nodding quietly at me. Thanks for the talk, Colonel. Time to get to class. Let me walk you. No, I'll be fine. She strides out of the cafeteria without explanation. I'm frozen for a moment, working to process everything that I've learned. I'd always known that there was more to Acura than just a crazy, fun-loving thespian, but I never expected to catch the glimpse that I did. Maybe we have more in common than I originally thought. I returned to the classroom in a daze, pondering this new turn of events. Even though I'm only slightly early, the classroom is already full attendance. I guess that with curfew in effect, there isn't much else to do except come to class on time. You sure? I turn to the door. Yahiko is standing in the entryway, speaking quietly with the stocky boy from yesterday, Hirobunya. I mean, what if you're right? Then we'll be damn glad that I decided to talk when I did. Maybe you shouldn't try this, not yet. Why do you keep trying to stop me? Three people, Haru. Three people were at the first meeting, are gone. First meeting? First meeting of what? That's why I need to talk to her, today. But you know the rumors. Soji talked with her, and he's fine. Be careful, dude. Eh, when am I not? Haru nods in farewell and disappears down the hall. Yahiko agitatedly rubs at his hair as he takes his seat. I'd better choose my words carefully. Who is that? Huh? Oh, Haru. He's a club member. Club member? Of the best club on earth, of course. The Happy Club, making people happy since 2018. Oh yeah, Happy Club. I always thought that it sounded like the stupidest thing in existence. But something dawns on me. What do you do in the Happy Club? I'd always assumed that it had something to do with alcohol or gambling, but... Why, we make depressed people happy, of course. I'm taken aback by this sudden display of altruism. Why? Why not? Not because he wants the undying loyalty of his future minions. Not because he wants to have a statue erected in his honor. I want to ask more, but the teacher promptly strides into the classroom, wrapping her pointer against the nearest table. The students quietly assemble. Three people who were at the first meeting are gone. Could Yahiko have been talking about his club? Three of the victims attended Happy Club? But what about the first two deaths before the Happy Club was even founded? Could they have a link to Yahiko? Could Yahiko know anything about the murders? Ah, you're looking particularly attentive today, Yama. Would you like to answer this question? I look up to the board. A terrifyingly large picture of a mutilated corpse is plastered in the center, mocking me through the gaps in its limbs and crimson bloodbath. My mind runs blank. No, no, no. Yama? I squeeze my eyes shut, shaking the image out of my head. A second look shows that the picture is just an artist's interpretation of the Isamu flag. No bodies, no blood, just brown and red. The hell was that? Five points deducted for lack of participation. Elizabeth? Elizabeth. Yes, ma'am. The flag, officially adopted during Mayor Inori's first mandate, represents the ideal that everyone can succeed with hard work, regardless of background, status, or upbringing. Thank you. Goodness gracious, I don't know what's going on with everyone today. Right, well, let's proceed. The flag is a proud symbol that has been acknowledged even by... I pull out of her lecture, disinterested, as my classmates secretly pass messages via their hacked desk tablets. I switch my own tablet on, but wince at the bold ten digits that greet me in reply. Don't say that to me. Say that to him. I quickly close the application. My mind is a mess throughout the remainder of class. Thinking about Soji, thinking about the crimes, it's just too much. Lunch could not have come sooner. Surprisingly, Yahiko turns to me when the bell rings. Hey, wanna grab some lunch with Masato and me? Kinda feels like it's been a while. Not even mentions it, it really does. I almost don't remember the last time the four of us had lunch together, assuming Rui joins us. I want to, I really do. 
but I don't know if I can talk to Masato after yesterday's exchange. I think I'll pass for today. You sure? Yeah, thanks for the invite, though. Okay. It's just, you know, dude, I feel like I haven't seen you in a long time. Sorry. Heck, some days I feel like I haven't seen me in a long time. Well, there's always room for more minions if you like and feel like joining. I'll keep that in mind. He all but skips out of the classroom, whistling between his teeth. A few days ago, I would have considered it completely natural. Now, it looks forced to me. I leave to get some lunch, ignoring Misaki's concerned gaze. After grabbing some takeout at the cafeteria, I settle in the courtyard, enjoying the fresh weather as best I can. It's fairly empty. Most students prefer to eat in the cafeteria. The only point of interest in, is the small group of girls huddled in the back corner, examining the wall. Wait a minute. You're a freak. I can't believe they still let you come here. First Akane, now Soji? You must pay for this. I edge closer, trying to find a clean perspective between the bundle of heads. I catch a glimpse of red hair. Again? Really? Maybe the administration loves you, but we know the truth. We won't stop until we have justice. You should stop showing your dirty little face around here. How are those thumbtacks in your gym shoes? Did they give you an idea of the pain we feel? No, no. She probably took them and saved them for voodoo dolls. Ugh, you're disgusting. Despite their biting words, Irie doesn't even bat an eye. She stares emptily at them, her hands folded neatly in front of her. Wow, look at her. She doesn't even care. Are you even human? Do you feel nothing for the suffering of others? I bet she enjoys it. It's probably her favorite pastime. What kind of six parents keep the retard like you? I clench my hands, hands as their words escalate to brutality. Irie isn't even lifting a finger to defend herself. Screw this. No one deserves this kind of treatment. I step to the outer edge of the circle, keeping my voice flat. Innocent until proven guilty. Really seeing it now. The girls turn to me, surprise flickering across their faces. Oh, well if it isn't the heartless bastard. I wince at her remark, but I managed to recover in time to hide it. And if it isn't the overbearing moron. Excuse me? Don't even have the guts to bully a girl half your height without backup. She colors rapidly as the others leap to her defense. We're not even bullying her. We're being fair. You can't talk. Look at what you said to Soji. Because clearly, the best way to help a hurting friend is to hurt someone else. They completely disengage, Iris circling around me. Iris killed people. Why are you taking her side? I bet he likes her. Yeah. He took her side last time, too. I only absorb this calmly before I respond. Maybe Natsuki and Shigure have ruined me for life. And you have concrete evidence of these murders? I'm sure that geniuses like you would never stop to stoop to accuse someone without standing. But, well, whenever someone talks to her, they mysteriously disappear within the next few days. You have... You five have also talked to a lot of people who have disappeared, but the only things you've killed are brain cells. Try again. What? Are you deaf? Haven't you heard all the rumors that she... Oh, I see. In the world of idiots, rumors qualify as concrete evidence. They stew silently, working to speak past their rage. I seize the opportunity to guide Irie out of the circle. Before we can leave, one of the girls steps in front of me with a hard look in her eye. You're taking the side of a monster? I return her stare with equal frigidity. Until you have actual evidence, kindly refrain from increasing the amount of stupidity I have to hear. We stride away as the girls gape at us. I'm stricken with equal parts triumph and guilt. Yes, I won. Yes, I defended Irie. How ironic that it had to be by the same method that I condemned. We stop at the school rooftop, where I take a moment to absorb the fresh air. Irie walks in front of me and examines me closely, a quizzical tilt to her brow. You were like Shigure. Yeah, I was. I scoff dryly. She frowns. Why did you stop them? I sink into the nearest bench. She settles beside me. Because. 
A wry laugh wrenches from my throat. Why didn't you stop them yourself? Why did you stand there? Why did you just let them, let them kill you inside? Even while I'm yelling, I already know the answer. Because it's easier. Easier to take the pain. Easier to just sit there. Easier to just let people call you a freak, a weirdo, a madman. Easier for you to blame yourself. Instead of answering my question, Irie wordlessly pulls something from her jacket. The play case, a handheld game console from Lemonscape. She stares, she starts it up, and after tapping idly on the screen, she hands it to me. I recognize it as a strategy RPG port of Code Dias, player versus player mode. You want to play against me? A tiny nod. Uh, okay. Didn't know you played games much. I mean, apart from Left Alive and the Gyu. And all the games I've been too scared to play. I select Susumu Kurumochi as my hero, leaving Lurug Lamparade for Irie, and start producing some basic units. Then I end my turn and pass the play case to her. You're gonna keep letting them push you around like that? I retaps the screen with blinding speed and hands it back. I don't care. Really. I can't see any of her units through the fog of war. I send out a recon scout as my heavy troopers slog from behind. They're saying some crazy stuff. Think of it this way. If you let them get away with it, they'll treat other people the same way too. I ponders a little before making her move but her fingers are just as assured as before. No, they only target me. I notice in bewilderment that my recon unit has seemingly vanished into thin air. I guess that she destroyed it. Quickly, I capture a factory and begin to produce tanks. Why just you? She passed it back almost immediately. They said it was because I have red hair. What? Therefore, I have no soul. I spot one of her infantry troops in the woods and quickly annihilate it with my tank. Nothing else in, is in sight. That's an old joke. It's an excuse to be mean to you. I read taps the play case. I hear an explosion and winds. Is it supposed to be a funny joke? My tank has vanished without a trace. I begin moving my forces toward the forest while seeking my hero, sneaking my hero across the edge of the map. No, it's a stupid joke, and it shouldn't have been made. I'll tell you a funnier one, if you like. She smiles lightly as she returns the play case. Yes. I can't tell if she's smiling because she has surrounded my forces, or if she's excited to hear the joke. I slip my hero through the fog of war. What does a clock do when it's hungry? It goes back four seconds. I wait for the punchline to hit but Irie only freezes, considering this joke for a long pause. A clock can go back in time? What? No, no, it's a pun. Four seconds. Four seconds going back for... Never mind. Nevertheless, Irie is smiling when she slips the play case into my hand. I'm left with just my final line of defense, but my hero finally reaches his intended destination, a special structure that doubles my DS counter. How about this? A Mexican magician tells his audience that he'll disappear on the count of three. He counts uno, then dos, and then disappears without a trace. I thought stage magic was just an illusion. I could only chuckle to myself. As expected, she completely missed the point. She makes her move. I hear a massive explosions. Oh, I won. What? I grip the play case. Her units have completely surrounded my base and are one turn away from capturing my headquarters. Not today, Larug Lamparade! I triumphantly conquer the special objective with Suzumu Kurumochi and activate my Dias. Table turn! I reverse the ratio of my shoulders to yours. Our soldiers suddenly swap colors, leaving her with practically nothing. Even if it's the end of my turn, I know I've used my Dias well. She looks at the screen intently. I sit back and relax. Even if she manages to kill a few of my soldiers, she's surrounded. Then she taps the screen and smiles. Good. Reinforcements. What? I lean over to look at the screen. My newly acquired soldiers still surround her character. 
but quite suddenly from the other side of the screen, a small squad of soldiers has appeared. Normally, a few soldier soldiers would be nothing, but my army is still with LaRue, and these new soldiers have a direct path to me. I blink, and suddenly they're surrounding me. Suzumu Kurumochi takes a couple down, but he's soon overrun. The words, Victor, LaRue, Lamparade, jump to life on the screen. Oddly cheery, considering the game genre. That was somewhat anticlimactic. What the? And she goes back to eating peaches, which she loves the most. So you're the master of video games. Got it. Her smile widens suddenly. Is she happy with my compliment? I just understood the joke. What? Four seconds. Four seconds. Four- oh! I should research the one about the Mexican magician. Uh, yeah. Not sure if I'll ever understand this girl. You're pretty passionate about video games, huh? I enjoy them. Are there any kinds you don't play? Bad ones. Well, I guess I can't argue on that one. So, do you have a favorite game out of all the ones you've played? Hyper Fabio Brothers. Just, just puns. Just walking away. That was a quick answer. Oh, why that one? You fight against the bad guy who steals peaches. I mean, there is a Princess Peach in it, so... Not sure what I was expecting. So, what got you into video games anyway? You didn't strike me as a gamer when I first met you. Then again, she didn't strike me as a singer. And look how well that turned out. They seemed fun, so I played some. They were fun. So, did someone just buy you a console and you decided sweet video games or something like that? Like, what was the first game you ever played? Castles and Creatures. Castles and Creatures. Wait, isn't that a... It's a tabletop, right? Old-fashioned, make your own stats, play with a party, go on adventures, all that stuff. You know, Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. How long? The standard table is two meters long. No, <laughs> how many years have you been playing tabletop? Speaking with Iri Hiriga is an unnaturally good ex exercise in creating complete sentences. Oh. Around five years. I played a lot before I learned about video games. But don't you need... I quickly stopped myself. A group of friends. That's what I was going to say, but that sounds too cruel even for me. Er, never mind. I played with AI. Huh? AI. Artificial intelligence. You know what it means. I was just surprised. Why? That's what is, was available. Available? Available where? At the, uh... Hey! Return in synchronization. Haru Bunya is standing on, at the rooftop entrance, arms folded across his chest. Well, that's convenient. I need to talk to you, Hiraga. I glance at Irie, looking for signs of discomfort. Her face is completely blank. Leave, Yama. The words are harsh, but her voice is soft. It's almost as if she was expecting this encounter. If you say so. I move to the door, but Haru grabs my shoulder, his eyes piercing into mine. Watch yourself. He releases me and continues to Irie as if he'd never said anything. So, is this what he meant earlier today? He was going to talk with Irie? Clearly, both he and Yahiko believe the rumors about Irie being tied with the disappearances, but despite that, he's still talking with her. Just what could be so urgent to trump their fears? I shake off my apprehension and return to class, resolving to ignore his words. We're not going to stay on the rooftop and eavesdrop on this shit. Motherfucker, that's what I would have done. And I'm going to end it here because I am all out of time and I don't want this getting too long. So, 
I'm interested to, to know what's going on on the rooftop right now. I would have loved to have stayed and eavesdropped on that because it seems kind of important. All things considered, the rumors surrounding Irie. But as of right now, I don't have an inkling of who the murderer might be. Because um, I feel like it could be Yama, the character we're playing as, because he does have uh, mental issues where he blacks out. And he did black out at night when, you know, a few of those murders took place. So it's entirely possible. But he also isn't like an artistic person so it kind of rules him out at the same time because whoever was doing the killings was using the blood as paint so that's fun uh but yeah i'm gonna leave it here i'll see you guys later and remember to do something nice for a stranger today you may just save a life bye, bye.